So welcome everyone to the February edition of the Uni Community Hours. For this time, we will be presenting the new version of Uni, which casually, since it's February, well, almost end of February, it's going to be 2022-02. Then Thomas will be presenting the new report database, which is something very interesting, especially if you ever wanted to get more, in, more insights and data about what Susan Manager is doing. And Kevin will be presenting how to apply Ubuntu patches and installation support. And of course, as always, we will have some minutes for questions and answer about anything that is on your mind. So let's get started. What is new on this universe? Well, first of all, we are changing the default password encryption mechanism that PostgreSQL is changing. And this is in preparation for PostgreSQL 14, which is going to be part of OpenSUSE Leap 15.4. Now, usually you should not do anything after this change. The only exception is if you created any kind of extra users because you wanted to grant the grant extra users at PostgreSQL because you wanted to grant them access to the UNI database. Otherwise, nothing to worry about. It's fully transparent for you. Then we have the new version of Prometheus 2.32.1. The biggest change uh, from the UNI point of view is that, is that now this, the UNI service discovery is part of upstream. So if for whatever reason you would be using the official releases, you would get the unit service discovery as well. That means that the configuration changed a little because some changes that were requested by upstream and you will need to apply the high state for all the instances where you have Prometheus installed, which should be either the uni proxies or some, some OUNI clients, SLE 12, SLE 15 or OpenSUSE lib. Of course, at the release notes for Uni, you will find more information about some other filters and fixes that are part of this Prometheus release, as well as a link to the full change log from upstream. We are also updating the Prometheus exporter to the version 0.10.0. In part, this is because this was required to support the new PostgreSQL authentication mechanism that I described above. But of course, there are a lot of other changes included. Again, you can check the full change log at the release notes. You also need to keep in mind that for this update, if you had monitoring enabled for the UNI server, you will need to enable it again because by default, the PostgreSQL exporter service will be disabled. That is because together with the version bump, we also had to rename the package. And by default, the packages at OpenSUSE are not enabled by default, but it's quite simple. If you follow the UNI release notes, you will see that it's just a matter of going to the web UI, uh, following the menu and just applying the, the change and everything will work again. We also added OpenSCAP for Debian 11. It's a tech preview. If you remember from the previous UUNI community hours, we told that uh, Debian 11 didn't have OpenSCAP because at some point during the development, while Debian 11 was still Debian testing, the package was removed from there. And by the time Debian 11 was released, OpenSCAP was not ready. What, it is, what we did in this case is to package the OpenSCAP package that uh, OpenSUSE seed or unstable, if you like, is shipping. It's building the package now for Debian 11. It's able to install, but of course, this is not an official solution. So we ask the community to try it. Let us know how things are working, and then we will see. For now, of course, you can report all the bugs. Anyone from the community can fix any bugs if there are any. But 
we cannot guarantee that we will apply fixes quickly enough for the next uh, UU version if there are any. That is the reason this is a tech preview. Then if I can jump into the next slide. We also have something that was presented by Ricardo during the December edition of the Uni Community Hours, which is SUSE Linux Enterprise Base as you go client support on cloud. So I will not repeat the details. If you want to check what this is about, you can go to the YouTube channel and check the December edition of this, uh, of this meeting. And then the last two things is wha are, are what um, Thomas and Kevin are going to present. First, the reporting database, and then the Ubuntu Errata installation. Now, as you probably are asking yourself, when is 2022-02 to be going to be released? Well, I don't think we will be in time to release it today, but I certainly hope that we will release it on Monday, which is, by the way, the last day of this month. And with that said, we have some time for some questions about the release, about the things that we are including, or whatever you want to ask. So go ahead, please. OK. I have a uh, question. Um, so on the Prometheus and Grafana stuff, I are we, uh, I know when Leap 15.4 releases, uh, they were trying to include newer versions of Prometheus and Grafana. Is Uyuni set to uh, consume those when that comes? Probably yes, but we still need to think about it because the benefit of having the packages in the unit itself instead of consuming them for from OpenSUSE is that we can include the new versions faster on a unit because otherwise those packages those packages if I'm don't if I'm not wrong are maintained at the um, SUSE code streams and they need to follow follow a different procedure. They would be aligned with other submissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the end, the packages that you see here as part of this unit release are the same packages that are going to be part of SLEE 15 as before. Because in the end, um, we and in this case we as the SUSE manager developers are the maintainers for Grafana the Prometheus and most of the exporters for both Uyuni, SUSE Manager, SLE, and ultimately OpenSUSE as well. Great, I was just, thanks for clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure I knew how that worked, but it's good to know that everything's aligned so you don't have dueling versions of my monitoring infrastructure, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so more questions. I was just doing an Uyuni training this week, and um, people really like the content lifecycle project thing. And there was a question whether there will be a space CMD um, command support in the future plans, because currently you only can. Um, maintain these projects using the web UI and some of the um, people wanted to do this using Ansible or SpaceMD commands. Are there any things planned? Mm -hmm. Avid? Um, not that I'm aware of. John, do we have already uh, at SpaceMD something that user can use? Uh, not really, not with this release. Okay. So, I, I, but I guess we do have API, right? API is there, yeah. Uh, yeah I right. also yeah. created uh, GitHub issues a couple of months ago for this, and I just wanted to to ask if uh, if there are some some news. But... No, there is no news uh, yet. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, but we we could look into that. Yeah, sure. And I was just wondering whether having s these features also available in Ansible, whether this is something that you would be interested in, because I was thinking maybe I could contribute some code and write some 
simple Ansible modules. I know you also wrote a lot of Python code for automation used with salt. Maybe we, we could simply port this to Ansible modules. This should be quite easy. Um, SpaceMD is also written in Python. Maybe we can implement something. What do you think? Uh, I mean, it, it would make sense, absolutely. Any kind of contribution is welcome, so for sure. Well, and if you're comfortable with Space CMD, I mean, you can use Space CMD to do any API calls also, right? You're right. I mean, it's a little convoluted. Yeah. But but nonetheless, at least it is a one way to to get there without having to wait for for the development. In, yeah. in, if if you're if you're willing to go into development, you can also add the uh, missing APIs to Space CMD. It's just a bunch of Python things. That's a good good point. I will have a look at the code. Don't mm -hmm. hesitate to to ask on 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 Gitter if you need code pointers. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Or if you create the pull request, you can leave us comments there, and we will have a look. But Obviously, such a contribution will be very, very welcome. And the same for Ansible. I don't see why we should not consider it as well. I think it's a good idea. And then in some future Uyuni community hours, you will be the presenter. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's a good idea, yeah. <laughs> Okay, any other question about the release? Otherwise, remember that after all the presenters are done with the presentations, we will have some more time for free discussions. Very well. And then, if I'm not wrong, the next one is Thomas. Yeah, that's right. Thomas, I'm going to... Well, I think I don't remember how to stop my presentation, but you can share your screen and it will override me. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. So you should be seeing my screen now, right? Yes. So, hi everybody. I'm going to talk briefly about the reporting database. So, uh, first we start with what is the reporting database? So this is an additional Postgres database that is installed on the Uni application server and is meant to be a data warehouse. So its purpose is to expose reporting data and make it available uh, to be queried by any external reporting tool that can uh, manage and deal with, uh, with SQL and SQL queries. So uh, the idea is to have a job that extracts, the normalizes, and aggregates uh, all the pieces of information that we have in our main uh, application database and um, put it into this new data warehouse database. And uh, the final goal is to have in the hub scenario an aggregation of all the data that are available uh, from all the peripheral server. So I can show you this schema, which is the idea that uh, we are trying to, to implement. So as I said, every server have uh, a local database, the reporting database which is uh, here in this diagram represented with this, this blue database. And uh, we have a task that takes uh, all the data from the application database and put it into the um, reporting database. And then when we are in a hub scenario, in the hub itself, all the, all the data from the peripheral servers are gathered and collected within the hub reporting database. So this will be the single point where the user can perform query to uh, analyze all the data and all information that are available within the hub structure. So first, uh, a disclaimer, because uh, this uh, feature is uh, still under heavy development. And uh, here we are currently releasing only the first, uh, the first uh, technical preview, the first part of this functionality. And uh, here we are including uh, basically the tooling to set up uh, the reporting database and the access to the reporting database. We are uh, releasing the Toscomatic job uh, that uh, extracts and process the data. And of course, the initial schema definition with the table structure and all the pieces of information that can be, can be extracted. So uh, when it comes to the tooling, what we have now currently working is the setup 
of the database, which is done automatically in the installation process or during the upgrade process. And uh, these, uh, these, this setup uh, set up the database and uh, configure the access. The database can be accessed uh, externally through SSL. And um, currently, we are installing these as part of the same server. But the idea is also to investigate the possibility to for the reporting database server to be on a separate external installation, which at the moment is not supported, but we will be working towards that as well. And uh, the other tool that we have implemented is the user management, because uh, currently during the setup, we create an administrator, administrator user that is automatically generated, but it's meant to be used only internally. And instead, to perform the query and access the data, the user will need to use a read-only user that can be created using the tool that we are setting up in this, in this release. And also part of this release, as I said, is the Tascomatic job, which runs periodically and can be customized as any other Tascomatic job through the web UI. And this job, uh, the purpose of this job is to refresh the reporting database, the reporting data. Uh, what it does is it, when it starts, it removes uh, all the data that are currently in the report database and it fetches uh, everything again from the application database. And so that uh, the data is uh, refreshed periodically and is, uh, this schedule can be configured by the user and the frequency can be configured. Uh, the last part is, of course, uh, the schema, which is currently in, uh, in a draft state. So we started from the existing reports uh, that, that we have uh, currently. We try to analyze and generalize them to, uh, to evaluate a data structure that uh, can hold uh, all the relevant data that can be useful to the, to the user to extract. So this is not an easy task, and so that's the reason why it's uh, still in draft and we are going to improve a lot on the subsequent releases on this and uh, all the tables in the reporting database as uh, additional pieces of information in particular we have two columns the most important one is the management id which currently is all, always set to one in the local scenario but this in the hub scenario is meant to represent uh, the id of the server that provided the data and so it's a very, very important information when we are in the hub scenario. And uh, the other part is the synchronization date, which is uh, the timestamp uh, when the last synchronization happened. And it will tell you how, how updated is the information that you are looking at. Also, uh, as part of the database, we have also views alongside the tables. These views are meant to be ready to consume reports that are already available and um, represent some uh, specific set of information that might be useful for multiple for multiple user and also they are meant to show how to combine the existing tables to extract uh, the piece of data that uh, that you want so now i will uh, show you a brief uh, demo of what we have now so now I'm connected to the test uh, to the test instance, and as I said, the report database is automatically set up. I can see that uh, here in uh, the RHN configuration. Here I can see that the report database is uh, is set up uh, because we have alongside of the usual uh, DB properties, we have the report DB properties to connect. This is the user that I said is automatically created during the setup process. The password, as you can see, is auto-generated, but the user do not need to actually use this one because this is meant to be used by the Tascomatic job and all the process, the internal process of, uh, of the server. And uh, here you can see that we have configured the SSL, SSL access because, as I said, this database is meant to be accessed external by reporting tools and also by um, any data any tool that can uh, access databases uh, sql databases to perform query and extract data and um, 
as I said, we have already updated the tools that we have. So for example, the spacewalk uh, schema upgrade tool, uh, it's already set up to accept also the report database to perform the upgrade of the schema during the, during the update of the system, but also the spacewalk SQL tool can be already used to access the report database. So for example, if I do report uh, db minus i i can already query the new the new database in this case as i said um, since i am on the local server i'm using an internal tool i'm using the um, administrator user but that's not how you are meant to query the database you are meant to create a specific user a read-only user so we have a tool for that which is a setup uh, you need set up record db user where you can uh, add a modify user so i can just add a new user add a password and create the role the new role so i can go to any machine so here for example i am on my local machine and i can access to the database <clears throat> so here you can see some of the tables that we have uh, that we have now as i said this schema is uh, still a huge work in progress because we are trying to define what may need the needs of the user and we are trying to come up with a reasonable structure to allow them to have the most flexible way to represent and extract the data but for example i can show you the system table which lists all the systems that are connected to this uh, to this server and as you can see we have the management id which in this case, is always one because this is the local database. And I have the synchronization date, which tells me when, when it was the last time that this data was uh, was synced through the through the job. And uh, apart from this, we have also views like the inventory report, which is uh, an um, another take on the invent of the existing inventory report that we have. So these already joins multiple table and present the data ready to be to be used and consumed by any tool. Uh, so, for example, here we have the the if you are familiar with the inventory report, these are a similar is a similar structure that what we have already. So you have the IP addresses of the server, the IP six addresses, and uh, all the configuration, the entitlements of the server, all these pieces of information that are grouped and extract from these uh, existing table that we have all the table are slightly normalized so we have um, uh, we have no need to do multiple joins most of the information are already available but you can combine all the data to uh, perform more advanced uh, advanced queries <clears throat> So I think that's uh, mostly it for what we have in this uh, in this version. As I said, we are um, working a lot uh, still uh, to do additional development. We first we have, as I said, to improve the schema because we need additional views, additional table. We need to ensure that all the relevant data and the, the data that have importance and um, might might need to be extracted is there is available and can be easily retrieved without too many joints or too many complex queries and another point that we need to improve on the schema is the documentation uh, currently we have um, uh, we have a document in the documentation that is explaining the uh, reporting database and uh, the structure so we have a um, this, uh, this image displaying the available table and everything. But uh, we definitely want to improve on this in order to have uh, an automatic generation of, um, uh, of the documentation. And also we need to implement the app scenario, which is the, still the biggest uh, improvement that we need to make. We need to implement additional job to support the app scenario so to gather the information aggregate them from multiple peripheral servers so that you are able to um, evaluate uh, all the all the pieces of data that are connected to that uh, to that hub 
And actually, there is one another thing that I haven't shown you at the moment, which is the um, task. As I said, you can we have this new taskomatic job here, which is the reporting update reporting, and this can be managed and configured as usual. And you can also schedule a new run from uh, from the interface. So I can just schedule a single run, and I will be able to once it completes. Now it takes some some seconds because mostly because of the <laughs> packages that we have in the database and the updates. But when this is finished, you can see from um, from the table that uh, the data is updated to the current uh, to the current timestamp. <clears throat> so every time you run uh, or you're scheduled to run that job, the job will update all the data that you that you have inside the, your uh, your database. So uh, I think that's it. If you have uh, any question regarding this. We can have uh, additional additional information. Thanks for going through that, Thomas. That was that was good. Yeah, and I think this is this is really nice, nice stuff to to be able to get a lot of, of data that otherwise until now it was well, it was still possible, but not really supported because of course the schema could change, the main schema could change at any time. So yeah, really great thing. Yeah, and also as I said, this is uh, still uh, under under development, so there can be rough edges at the moment, but we are we are working. We are still working hard on this to iron out everything and make sure that uh, all the data that uh, that are important are available. Okay, so if there are no further questions, then let me see. Yeah, Kevin is here. So Kevin, the floor is yours. You can just present your screen and start. Okay, give me a second. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see an Uniserver 2022.02. Okay. So I'm gonna just um, give a brief demo of um, the Ubuntu Rata handling. And um, yeah, so all you have to do for um, Ubuntu Rata handling is sync the Ubuntu channels. So here the channels are already synced um, and the Rata information is um, automatically fetched um, after syncing the channels. Um, after that, you will see that um, now those channels will have patches in them. Um, and you can just look at them like you um, can do with the other patches for Red Hat and SUSE. Um, you can also see that um, the advisory here um, has the Ubuntu um, security IDs. So you can look up those IDs here. Uh, on the Ubuntu Security Network page. Um, and yeah, so here we have an Ubuntu server that um, has uh, currently five critical updates that need to be installed. And you can already see here the other five erratas. And we are just gonna install all of them. Uh, schedule this and I guess we have to wait a little bit um, until this is done. It didn't take too long. So it's pretty much all the same um, as for the ratas you used to um, just now also for Ubuntu. Um, so there's not much um, to do differently or really anything to do differently. And now 
those packages are installed. So we can go back and if you put it in the package it's also refreshed. Not sure if it was just me, but I lost you for a few seconds. The sound. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So yeah. So now we just have to wait, I guess, until the package list is refreshed, and then maybe do it manually. Now so maybe um switch to the VM. And now I'm not sure if you stop sharing the screen, but I, I stopped sharing the screen. Ah, okay, okay. I just yeah. wanted to Okay, Chrome doesn't let me share my terminal. Okay, let's go back to that then. Okay, yeah, so it refreshed. Uh, I wanted to also show on the uh, Ubuntu side that the packages are installed, but now Uyuni has caught up and um, those updates are installed. So it shows um, the critical issues are gone. So that's pretty much it. So nothing really new, just now you can also patch your Ubuntu servers and see the ratas um, of Ubuntu. And yeah. Uh, and I assume that it also works with the CV audit tool in Uyuni? Yes, exactly. So that's okay. the same. It, it just um, looks at the CVEs that are in the um, Ubuntu erratas, and if it's there, then it will just show up. So every, everything um, should work normally, like in, with the other erratas, as long as Ubuntu provides us the information. Yeah, you said that maybe this is not big news. I think those were your words, but still, I think this is something really, really great. <laughs> I can see just by the reactions of the at the at the chat. So sometimes even the small things can be very useful. In this case, the question I see on the chat is: Is there anything that needs to be done from the server or client side, or is it just working like for normal patches? It's pretty much working just for like for normal patches. Um, so when you sync the Ubuntu channels, it will, um, after the sync, um, also download the errata information. And after that, um, it should just work the same way. And every time you um, sync the Ubuntu channels, it will also update the errata information. So uh, in a normal case, there shouldn't be anything you need to do. You need to make sure that you um, your system has access to um, the Ubuntu domains that have the security information. Yeah, don't firewall it off and then expect it to magically appear, right? <laughs> <laughs> or if you do it, make sure that if you are using a proxy, the proxy will allow access to such resource. Yeah, that's a very, very, very good point, in fact. Okay. Are there no any questions. more questions? Hmm? Thanks, Kevin. Okay, yes. So, you know, I'm trying to now um, merge this pending pull request for, for this with a small fix. <laughs> Cedric, the huge <laughs> reveal you did means that backporting into master is giving me more trouble than I expected, but I hope to have it ready by the end of the day, at least. So thank you very much, Kevin. Sorry sorry for having fixed a lot of um, compiler issues. 
No, no, don't worry. I mean, that's that's very nice. The, very nice. The only problem, of course, is that backporting from from a branch which still doesn't have such fixes is now slightly complicated. But I don't expect many yes. people will be doing that. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, and uh, yeah, if there are no more questions uh, about the topic Kevin just presented, then we still have time for. Pretty much everything you want to ask, discuss, any ideas you have. So go ahead, don't be shy. Hi, Stefan here yet again, as always. <laughs> um, I got a question on the subscription manager. I'm uh, This is the package. I'm trying to understand it. Um, what exactly is it doing? And do I really need it? You mean the subscription matcher, maybe? The matcher, sorry, ma uh -huh. matcher, something with an M. Subscription matcher, then probably, yeah. In the master branch. Because the way I understand it, it's it's more to match um, the, the SUSE subscriptions to systems. Basically, yes, that's the idea. Because in the in the end, when you are registering SUSE Linux Enterprise Systems to you to your Uni server, well, now now you know that uh, we have this uh, this new feature to forward data to SCC. So at least you can see there the instances you have. But it, but the Uni server itself is not checking if you are complying with the uh, licenses you have. So for example, if you bought, I don't know, 1000 licenses, the uni server will mm, not prevent you from bootstrapping 1001. And that tool is helping you to ensure that you comply with the license usage. But does it technically, or even from a use case perspective, apply to a uni? Or is it only for SUSE manager? I would say it's interesting for Uni as well because in the end you can still onboard SUSE Linux enterprises with the Uni, right? So, of yeah, course, that's the question will... really if that's possible or if that's a use case. I, I, I'm not aware. <laughs> that's why. Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible. You can onboard SLE 12 and SLE 15 to to Uni. Okay. Yeah, the reason why I was asking is because I'm working on the um, enterprise Linux ports and. Um, it it would save a lot of Java ports, so I, I just saw the lots of Java dependencies and I thought, hang on, do I really need it? Hmm. Yeah, in this case, it would be of course that if it is not available, then someone using Uni on top of enterprise Linux will not be able to use the subscription matcher and will not have the ability to see, hey, I'm really using uh, all the the licenses that I have uh, yeah. bought, or I'm, I'm exceeding the the licenses. That's the, the usage case, so yep. Okay, so the use case would actually be even cross operating system to do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering maybe there was a mandatory you have to be on a like a SUSE Linux version or something like that uh, contractually. But no, okay, that, that, no, I understand. Then, then I, I'll keep it. I was just curious. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No problem. I have also a question regarding the subscription manager. I was just wondering, I have a customer who runs uh, SUSE manager and he's also running power machines. So they're using power VM and currently it's not possible that subscription manager retrieves the information from IBM power VM to match the subscriptions which are registered in the SUSE customer center. Did anybody ever had to deal with IBM Power VM and does know how to match the subs, 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 subscriptions in a matter that it's uh, working correctly? And um, yeah, or am I the only user who has to deal with IBM Power VM? <laughs> I do know that, yeah, there was uh, some work uh, in the past. I'm not really sure if it was about subscription uh, matching. But I would suggest to, you know, maybe ask this question on um, uh, on Gitter or probably create an issue. So some uh, some of our experts who have more inside knowledge of this tool can guide you there. Yeah, I already created a ticket and I also created a customer support request and they they were like, OK, that's nice that you created an issue. 
Um, we have it on our list, but we haven't found a solution yet. That's why I thought maybe I can ask in this um, in this meeting. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the guys who, <laughs> who worked on this tool, they aren't uh, in this meeting, so. Yeah. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> but anyway, we will bring this card to their attention so they can have a look as well and leave a reply there because in the end it will be useful for the rest of the uni community, anyone that is using yeah. our PC as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jonas here. Hi. Um, I just have a question about the user managing interface of uni. So are there any plans to like um, re refine the user structure or the, the user interface a little bit? Because well, we have we have several users that I would like to grant access to uni, but only to their specific VMs. Plus, I want to um, how do you say? Um, I don't want to give them all the rights for the VMs, so I just want to give them specific rights, like maybe to update that, but I don't want them to change the channels. So um, are there any plans for the future to um, to make it more like granular, more granular permissions for, for the users? Uh, definitely in plans, but it's it's it, it, and this has been uh, on our radar for quite some time and has been requested for by many customers as well. But this is this is quite uh, quite a big uh, task to actually have it, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, it's on radar uh, for now. Uh, currently, in the near future, uh, we don't see it happening, but it's definitely one thing that we would need to uh, we want to explore actually. And uh, it will not fulfill your use case completely. But if I understand the question mm -hmm. correctly, if you uh want to use two different organizations then it's possible to grant access to you let's say that you have organization a and organization v and then some servers belong to the organization v then you have users that only belong to that organization v and they will only see those vms mm -hmm. not everything else that's something we use even internally here at, at suse and I don't know if we have QA people here, but they have a separate organization. And with my user account, even if I'm a Susemani administrator, I don't see their instances. Okay, so I would have to um, like create a new organization for these VMs because what's mainly the point is that I have users that should not change the channels, but they should be able to um, well to upgrade their VMs actually. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid that's not possible. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a, uh, yeah. I mean, I probably have one of the ugliest system manager servers. It's not a uni, but it's this manager where I have almost 20 organizations. <clears throat> I do all of my channel work in one organization and then just build a trust between them. So the other orgs just simply consume the channels they don't actually create them. Where it gets complicated is if you're also trying to have those sub organizations able to do content lifecycle management because then it gets tricky in sharing those channels across between them. But um, no. but no, it's possible with organizations to accomplish some of at least some of what you're suggesting. Uh, well, okay. Well, we use the the lifecycle management, of course, to to stage the upgrades into like testing and development and production stage. So also, these users should not be able to to change to 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 make a lifecycle because that's well, that's a task. For, right, it's going to bust everything. Job. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember from back in the days we used to use uh, this Ubuntu management tool like landscape thingy. It had a quite the tool actually is really bad, but the the permission sections for the users was quite okay. Um, but yeah, then I well, I think we'll try with different organizations if this uh, this makes sense. Yeah, why not? Thanks. Yeah, and if you run into trouble, just reach out. You know, one of us will try Great. to help give you some guidance.
Well, great. Thank you. Maybe just an idea that I had um, while uh, listening to the idea. I, I mean, we have this free IPA support in Uyuni. So it, when you have a free IPA or this Red Hat identity management system, you can link them. So maybe it would be also great to have the possibility when we have such things like role-based access control, maybe at a later stage, that we could also apply this uh, from a free IPA perspective. So maybe like for Foreman and Cartello, we have exactly this. You can define your own roles and they could also be defined on the um, directory side. That would be just awesome. Yeah, I'm sure any kind of role-based uh, access controls will be able to map those to uh, external authentication defined users. It's going to be indirect. I mean, obviously, we're not going to modify the schema of an Active Directory or a free IPA, but uh, but certainly being able to consume those and then ultimately assign roles to those um, either in an SSO or in a PAM-based connection certainly will be part of the consideration. Okay, a word from me for those of you that are developing something for Uni, because since I mentioned that uh, Zedric merged a uh, big request with uh, big pull request with with changes as he described to fix the pro uh, problems with uh, detected by IntelliJ how to fix if I recall correctly, right, Cedric? Yep. Uh, it you should consider in that case rebasing from master if you have a pull request that is old because you will see that you have some conflict that you need to fix. I'm not sure, Cedric, maybe it would be interesting if you can send an email about this to the devil mailing list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be great, thanks. And yeah, speaking about development, um, so Google Summer of Code uh, is about to start. Um, so at, as of today, OpenSUSE has applied and um, the applications are reviewed by Google. So Uyuni will take part of Google Summer of Code as part of uh, OpenSUSE organization. On March 7th, Google will tell everyone what organization are allowed to participate and students will be able to look at them and at the projects that are published. Um, so there are two calls here. One is file project IDs um, on the OpenSUSE mentoring repository on GitHub. And the other one is if you know students that would could be interested, just uh, tell them that we're applying. After all, it's pretty good to work on open source software that you, uh, and get getting paid by Google. Um, are there any projects already suggested, or is that later? Uh, there are already projects suggested. One is about uh, refactoring the uh, salt testing infrastructure that we have at OpenSUSE. So that has been proposed by Alex and Pablo. And I proposed a uh, refactoring of the um, systems list pages because these are still JSPs and we would like to convert them to React.js. And a previous Google Summer of Code did, uh, did convert the conversion for one of them last year. So it should be easier for the other ones. All right, thanks. Okay, I'm trying, trying. I'm trying to remember, Cedric. Did we send that? Did we send that to the mailing lists? Um, no, I tried pinging people individually to ask uh, to to file IDs. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want, you can you can send them, send it to the mailing list, and I I can take care of uh, publishing this at the Twitter profile as well. Okay. Okay. So let's do it. 
Very well, let me see the chat. Maybe there are some other questions. Mm, no, not, not really, but we still have some time if someone else wants to ask anything. Otherwise, I think we can wrap up. So thanks a lot to everyone for being here, sharing your time with us, sharing your thoughts for the, to the presenters, of course, for all the very interesting presentations. As always, remember, we are available at Gitter, at the mailing list as well. We are reviewing as much as we can all the issues at GitHub. Feel free to contribute at any at any time. Remember that the contributor doesn't need to be strictly a developer. You can help us with documentation as well, or tests, or a lot of other things. Even submitting if you want to pull request for the website, it's um, uh, it's published at GitHub as well. It's not another repository. So, in the meanwhile, have a nice weekend. Happy hacking. Enjoy of Unit 2022 02 when it's ready, I guess on Monday already. And I will see you in one month. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. See you bye soon. Bye. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.